Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give you a market overview and update containing monetary history, the facts of today and some possible scenarios for the future. It reflects my point of view based on the findings of certain characters I very much adore, such as the famous Swiss private banker Ferdinand Lips, writer of the most famous book Gold Wars. It comes from a perspective based on the theories of the Austrian School of Economics and last but not least, some excellent information in relation to the gold market provided by a young and very intelligent precious metals analyst in Austria named Ronald Steffeli, who just released his new In Gold We Trust report in July 2012. The purpose of this presentation, we want to provide private and institutional investors a glimpse into our point of view because we are convinced that today's situation differs greatly from that during recent crises. For this, we rely on the economics of the Austrian School of Economics. You will receive a short summary of monetary history backed by the latest market information. We will provide the necessary facts highlighting the chances and dangers as to why we favor precious metals as a means of asset protection. Finally, you will get tips on what investment opportunities exist and what to look for when evaluating the individual investment options. At the same time, we hope to awaken your interest in the Austrian School of Economics. We're going to have a short introduction, then we will follow by macroeconomic view, the key insights from monetary history, state of the gold market, how to invest in precious metals, and how global gold can help protect your future. Once I wrote a book which started with the following sentence, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Or as Goethe used to say, experience remains the best divining rod. So one of the core focus of this presentation is to learn from history to avoid making the same mistakes again. The last centuries have been dominated by the theories of John Maynard Keynes, which is based on centralized government structures as the hail of the world. Therefore, I would like to ask you to forget all about the teachings of Keynes in regards to his monetary theory. I hope you will approach my presentation with the needed frankness, which requires the ability to think independently and to draw logical conclusions. My economic view is based on the understanding and theory of the Austrian school with its important mentors, Karl Menger, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich August von Hayek and Murray Rothbard, to name just a few. Their view of life is mainly based on the fact that people may live in freedom and that only the implication of force over other people is forbidden. Moreover, people shall be allowed to decide freely and without any constraint what they select and accept as money. In today's life of public central planning, combined with increasingly radical intervention, this is a topic which is getting more and more important especially within the developed, or let's just say, occidental world, where an accumulating huge debt pile is already out of control. Let's take a closer look at the major features and the respective differences between the theory of Keynes and the Austrian School of Economics. John Maynard Keynes turned the whole world upside down with his argumentation that savings is not a premise for investments. On the contrary, it is a burden for economics his opinion was that wise and clever planners at the central switch point would know more and that they could correct macroeconomics imbalances by manipulating market signals. That's why, in most cases, he saw an easing of lending as the only solution. This theory implies the existence of a wise government who has a large influence at every level of economics. Freedom was not a subject which kept Keynes busy. As we can see, this system enables a massive centralization of power. In this context, Lord Acton stated it best over 150 years ago, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Austrian school, however, stands for private ownership, free markets, healthy money and the free thinking society. It enables us to understand the economy under consideration of the unpredictability of human actions. No one, really no one, can foresee the future. The Austrian school takes into consideration the very important role of which people's decision have on all transactions and explains how things are put in order despite the apparent chaos of individual actions. Conclusion, the Austrian school offers the strongest defense. Striving for personal and individual happiness is key. 
The basic for such a society and economics is built on market money, which can be chosen by people themselves, free of any constraints or enforcement. As history shows us, such an item has to possess the following features. It has to be comparable, dividable, it has to be rare and easily transportable. Gold and silver accomplished these features the best, and this is also the reason why these metals have been the top medium of exchange over the past 5,000 years. Gold and silver have an inner value and are not dependent upon promises of debt redemption by a third party. That's why I believe that the central banking system is ultimately the root of all evil. It's wrong and insane that we stick to a monetary paper system, which is based on the promise that the accumulated unpayable debts have to be redeemed by the actual and future generation via taxes and inflation. Furthermore, it is a fact that all past fiat systems have ended up in hyperinflation, having built the basis of wars and destruction. The actual system is only the longest lasting experiment so far, and at this point, we don't have anything to even compare it to. I would like to show you today the meaning of gold within a liberal society, social system and how it acts as a guarantor for the persistency of the most valuable good, the freedom of people. The goal of this presentation is to substantiate this short introduction with some hard facts. That's why we will take a closer look to some macroeconomical developments. Afterwards, I will talk about gold and its most important boosters responsible for the long-lasting bull market we have seen. I will show you some slides of the bull market during the period between 1970 and 80 compared to the actual situation. The idea here is to really evaluate whether gold is in a bubble or not. Last but not least, I will then provide a brief introduction of our company, Global Gold. I want you to understand not only what we do, but also which issues we consider most important in regards to using precious metals as safeguard against the possible collapse of the actual currency and financial system. Let's start with quotes from Alan Greenspan. The abandonment of the gold standard made it possible for the welfare statists to use the banking system as a means to an unlimited expansion of credit. They have created paper reserves in the form of government bonds, which, through a complex series of steps, the banks accept in place of tangible assets and treat as if they were an actual deposit, as the equivalent of what was formerly a deposit of gold. The holder of a government bond or of a bank deposit created by paper reserves believes that he has a valid claim on real asset, but the fact is that there are now more claims outstanding than real assets. And he goes further, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for the owners of wealth to protect themselves. And in the same essay he's writing, this is the shabby secret of the welfare statist tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the statist antagonism toward the gold standard. Alan Greenspan resigned as the chairman of the Federal Reserve System for nearly 20 years. Having taken over the position starting in 1987, he had been responsible for the biggest credit expansion in fiat money in the history of the United States. In 2003, Congressman Dr. Ron Paul handed over to Alan Greenspan a copy of his article, Gold and Economic Freedom, of which Greenspan had written in 1967 and ask him if he wants to repeal. The answer Green, Greenspan gave was, and I quote, I wouldn't change a single world. So what says Henry Ford on the monetary system? It is well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Alan Greenspan was quoted as saying back in 2010, during a conference of the Council on Foreign Relations, that fiat money has no place to go but gold. 
So let's have a look at the US true money supply versus exponential growth rate. Here is the one chart which defines the background to all events in the coming years. It is the Mises Institute true money supply for the US dollars. The true money supply consists of cash, checking accounts and no notice deposit accounts, as well as a few other minor cash balances. It represents the actual cash and electronic cash in the system that is instantly available for purchases of goods and services, and this chart goes back to 1959. The dotted line is the exponential growth trend, or in other words, the maximum rate of growth that can continue forever. In this context, I usually like to quote Kenneth Boulding, economist and social scientist, who once said, Anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. This trend was valid until mid-2002. However, since then, the true money supply has accelerated at the faster rate, telling us that true money supply growth entered a hyperbolic phase when the Fed eased rates in the wake of the dot-com collapse. In other words, the true money supply is already hyperinflationary. What does hyperinflationary mean and is there a difference between inflation and rising prices? According to the economists Gregor Hochreitner from Austria, these two terms are used interchangeably nowadays. Mr. Hochreitner claims that his blurred terminology comes with grave consequences because it prevents us from recognizing the cause and effect relationship and, as a result, keeps us from solving the real problem. Therefore, it is of utmost importance to distinguish between inflation and rising prices. As per the Austrian School of Economics, inflation describes the expansion of the uncovered money supply whereas rising prices denotes the increase in the general price level. In general linguistic usage, the latter tends to get reduced to the segment of consumer prices. Inflation is the root cause of the devaluation of money, whereas prices increases are just a result of inflation. So this true money supply shows you how in the background inflation continues to be fueled on a hyperbolic basis. Bear in mind, that economists, here they are again, are now telling central banks to accelerate monetary growth even faster to offset the tendency for bank credit to contract. They see no other way to avoid the bank balance sheet implosion with all the deflationary consequences that it implies. So the prospect for 2012 and thereafter are for TMS to continue its hyperbolic trend and incidentally continue supplying funds for a government deficit completely out of control. Also bear in mind that when such a trend becomes established, it becomes almost impossible to stop since the whole debt-based economy and the banking system would collapse. <clears throat> US funded debt. As you can see on this slide, in January 1946, the funded debt stood at 260 billion. In June 2012, the debt stood at 15 thousand seven hundred billion US dollars and when we look at the time periods between 46 and 66 the yearly average increase was 3.10 billion between 66 and 86 the yearly average increase was 74.75 billion so already a 25 multiplicator versus 1946 to 66 when we look at the next 20 years between 86 and 2006, the average increase per year was 304 billion. So already 99 times the average yearly increase between 46 and 66. And now what we can see since 2006 is a yearly average increase of 1 trillion, uh, 199,000. So that leads to a multiplicator of 370 times average the yearly increase between 1946 and 66. So what does it mean? I mean, the funded debt does not even cover the future liabilities such as social security, government pension and Medicare costs. I'll have more info on that with the next slide. 
In the baby boomers' formative years, it took the US government a year to increase their funded debt by 3.1 billion. Today, as boomers retire, it takes the government 23 hours to do the same. It is important in this context to mention that US government debt had reached a total of US dollars 14.790 billion by the end of 2011, with interest paid amounting to US dollar 454 billion at an average rate of 2.9%. Within the past 20 years, debt has increased by 350%, while the interest burden has only risen by 60%. If interest rates were on similar level as in 1991, interest paid would have increased to 1.2 trillion. According to the CBO Congressional Budget Office, government debt will rise to US dollar 20,000 billion by 2015. Let me give you an example of something that has happened only during the last 10 years. The USA has three times as many treasury bonds outstanding as it did in 2002. The average rate has fallen from 6.1 to 2%. This can only happen when central planners can artificially manipulate the natural level of interest rates. Otherwise, it would be completely illogical. One instrument on how to push interest rates down is by monetizing debt directly through the central banks. And here in 2011, 61% of all US bond issues were bought by the Federal Reserve. So I think a clear pattern is visible here. Funded and unfunded government debt in percentage of GDP. So the explicit public debt or so-called funded debt equals the official governmental debt, for example, secured debt payable from the current revenue of the government. The implicit government debt represents unfunded liabilities and describes the difference between outstanding claims public spending and expected payments revenue. It covers the funding gap between all future payment obligations and the expected projected governmental revenues should the current policy remain in place. Included are governmental promises to pay, especially in regards to pension and pension right claims. As Ronald Stöffeli from Erste Group Research stated in his Gold Report 2012 in Gold We Trust, retirees and welfare recipients already account for 59% of US tax papers, up from 47% in 2008. Over the coming 19 years, 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 every day and thus reach retirement age. Herbert Stein used to say, if something cannot go forever, it will stop. And as we can see, the unfunded debt liabilities in the US, I mean, it's five times higher, Germany four times, France, and here we have Greece with eight, 900% of it. <clears throat> so it will be hard to maintain that. So how does one finance debt? As we have seen before, by lowering the interest rates. On August 15, 1971, President Nixon closed the so-called gold window, refusing to let foreign banks redeem their dollars for gold, facilitating the devaluation of the US dollar which had been fixed relative to gold for almost 30 years. This action was a direct reflection on the fact that the US was actually already bankrupt at that time. In 1973, a system of floating exchange rates was implemented and by doing so, they opened the floodgate for a never before seen creation of money and credit. This led to a situation within the United States where inflation rates went through the roof and where Paul Volcker, at that time the chairman of the Fed, had to increase interest rates up to almost 20%. Inflation was as high as 13% by the end of the 1970s, but the official rates for short-term bonds were only at 8%. Therefore, the real interest rate as at that particular moment stood at a negative 5% per year, and as you will see later on in this presentation, gold and silver, silver prices increased enormously. However, the difference in terms of increasing interest rates back then and now is the US total debt level. As you can see in the 80s, the debts of the US were relatively small in comparison to the debts we have today. Since then, the US has become the world's biggest debt donation and making any increase in interest rates unsustainable, as we can see on this particular slide. So the blue line 
total debt and the green line represents the federal fund rates. And here we can see from 80 basically the way it moved up, how much it increased the total debt and what happened to the interest rates. Huh? As we have seen before, not only the US, but the whole world is currently facing the highest level of public debt in times of peace. The far-reaching consolidation of public budgets does not seem to be up for discussion. The necessary grave cutbacks are being postponed, and the policy of muscling through is cheerfully continued. It is logical that you can't fight over indebtedness by adding even more debt. It is important to underline that the driving forces of economic health are savings and investment, not consumption and debt. According to the Austrian School of Economics, every act of consumption has to be preceded by production first. Debt is nothing but consumption brought forward, which will then not take place in the future. There does not seem to be any painless therapy of these problems. We at Global Gold believe, therefore, that gold is, in a, is an effective medicine. We don't expect that interest rates will be pushed up anytime soon and that central banks will keep on flooding the market with new paper money. As a consequence, we will see a negative level of interest rates, and this will be one of the key drivers behind the rising price of gold. One word in regards to negative interest rates, they punish the savers because the value of their assets savings are going to be inflated. Only the debtors and therefore the states are profiting from it because their amount of debts are going to be inflated also. What a lousy and unfair system. Please note that we are actually facing negative interest rates as an example on two-year bonds in Switzerland, Denmark, Germany, Netherlands, Finland and Austria. And then who has to pay for it? Here you can see the Yao's unemployment rate of the industrialized nations. Up to the end of 2011, approximately 74.8 million young people worldwide, aged between 15 and 24, had no job. Since 2007, the year before the crisis, the number of unemployed has even grown by more than 4 million young people. The actual rate of Yao's unemployment is at 12.7%, and it doesn't look like things will be improving in the near future. So here we can see Portugal up to 36.1%, Italy 35.9%, Ireland 30%, Greece, Spain more than 50%. Guy Ryder, vice president of the International Labour Organization, said on April 9th of this year that, quote, this is a ticking bomb with a tremendous destructive potential which could lead to social turmoil. We run the risk of losing a whole generation. Let's face the general unemployment rates seasonally adjusted. Here you can see the official unemployment rate of the industrialized nations in total. According to Ryder, the global unemployment rate amounted to 196 million people by the end of 2011. The forecast assumes that in 2013, 207 million persons, or 5.6% more people, will be without employment. In this context, it is important to see that these are official statistics, and who you can give credit to or not, it's up to you. But here we can see the EU 17 stands at 10.9%. Uh, and the US, for example, at 8.1, that's the official figures. In the US, for instance, the official unemployment rate is 8.1%. When we look at the calculation of the unemployment rate based on the model provided by shadow stats, the unemployment rate goes up to 22.5%. So shadow states is actually using the original version of how these kinds of calculations were done by the US government agencies in the past. Their calculation includes people who slip through the cracks, as an example, people who were frustrated and gave up the active search for a job, or those who accepted lim time-limited job with McDonald's or Wendy's. In one of the recent reports by the International Labour Organization, it was stated that the soaring unemployment is increasing the risk of social unrest. They came to the conclusion that in 57 out of 106 nations analyzed, the potential for social unrest was increasing rapidly. 
And this last slide for the food vouchers in the United States. So this slide shows the dramatic increase of citizens who depend on federal food vouchers. Actually, the number lies at 46 million Americans, which represents roughly 16% of the total population in the United States. And there is no silver lining on the horizon because the real economy continues to stagnate. Back in 06, 26 million. January 2012, 46 million. So let's dive into some monetary history facts. Um, here is, I would like to show you the length of time gold played a role in the monetary system and the steps and wars it took to abandon it. Phase 1, 1816 to 1940, the classic gold standard. Ferdinand Lips described the 19th century as a period of prosperity and economic growth without inflation. In those days, the world's major currencies remained stable over a long period. It was the age of the gold standard. The basic rule of the gold standard was a fixed price for gold, with each currency being convertible into gold at a specific rate. All balance of payments deficits on an international level were settled in gold. It was impossible for politicians to manipulate gold and therefore it provided citizens with a currency that maintained its value. The world economy was operating to its full potential and rising standards of living for the masses meant low or no unemployment. Because there was no inflation in this golden world of security, people could live on their savings and concentrate on cultural activities. On December 23, 1913, when most of the parliamentarians were already on their way home, President Wilson signed into law the Federal Reserve Act that created the Federal Reserve System. Phase 2, 1914 to 1918, World War I. In 1914, at the beginning of World War I, the gold standard was thrown overboard within a few weekends. In order to finance the war, the world restored resorted to deficit financing and paper money. Lip stated in his famous book, Gold Wars, that had the gold standard not been given up, the war would not have lasted more than a few months. Instead, it lasted more than four years and ruined most of the major economies in the world and left millions dead in its wake. It was planned to return to the gold standard after World War I, but to achieve this, the consequences would have been that all nations which have hollowed out their national currencies because of the war deficits would have needed to depreciate their own currency versus gold. Therefore, it would have been necessary for the national gold reserve and the respective value of each country's paper money to come back into balance again. This did not happen because the British in particular refused to go that route because of the foreseeable erosion of trust of the British pound. Phase 3, 1922 to 1931, the so-called gold exchange standard. At the Chinua conference in 1922, the gold exchange standard was introduced under which the dollar and the British pound were as good as gold and could be held as reserve currencies. As mentioned before, it is important to note that these currencies had lost purchasing power and therefore couldn't be as good as gold. The immediate effect on this new system was that the reserves were now counted twice, first in the country of issue and then in the creditor, creditor country that held it as a reserve. Let me give you an example to explain why the reserves have been counted twice. Let's assume that an American company would have bought the German company for 10 million US dollars. Under the gold standard, the 10 million US dollars would have been reduced in the money supply within the States because 10 million in the amount of gold would have been shifted to the account of the German Bundesbank. In return, the German Deutschmark would have expanded in the equivalent of 10 million US dollars, because the German Bundesbank would have received gold worth 10, billion, uh, 10 million US dollars. But under the gold exchange standard, the broad money of Germany expanded by the equivalent of 10 million US dollars in Deutschmark, but the broad money in the US has never been reduced in return by taking 10 million US dollars out of circulation 
because the US dollar were as good as gold under the gold exchange standard. So what the Germans did was that they took, in this particular case, the 10 million US dollar and bought for the same amount US treasury bills, whereby they received an interest payment on. Therefore, the US didn't have to reduce the broad money supply because they kept the gold reserves. Furthermore, the reserve countries were able to run balance of payment deficits without being punished as long as the other nations had confidence in their currencies. The new system set the gigantic money and credit machine into motion and created the inflationary boom of the 1920s. The new mechanism proved to be an engine of inflation whose product, excess, excess purchasing power, flowed abundantly into the real estate and the stock markets. This was the cause for the inevitable corrective depression starting with the crash of 1929. Phase 4. 1931 to 1945, fluctuating fiat currencies and World War II. The years of the Great Depression, Keynes economics had become the world's dominant economic theory. The stock market crash between 1929 and 1932 and the Dow Jones industrial average lost about 90% of its value. Even tangible assets such as real estate were similarly hard hit. Residential and commercial buildings lost up to 80% of their value. Most commodities suffered a similar fate. The consumer price index during 1929 and 1933 dropped by 24%. Only gold did well. Its price increased by 75% from US dollar 20.67 to US dollar 35 an ounce. In 1933, President Roosevelt abandoned the gold standard and US citizens had to surrender the government all of their gold in exchange for paper money. It was forbidden to hold in the US and shortly after the enactment of these prohibitions, the president under authority granted by the Congress devalued the gold dollar. Before 1933, the Federal Reserve notes contained the promise that they could be converted into gold. Later, the caption was changed to read that the bill could be exchanged for lawful money of the United States, except more of the same. Economist and gold expert John Exter described that period as follows. The contraction was so powerful that it took Roosevelt three terms and the war to get out of it. In 1933, unemployment stood at 25%. By 1937, it had fallen to 15%, but in 1937 to 38, the stock market took another dive, the economy went into another contraction, and unemployment climbed back to 21%. World War II, of course, cured unemployment. Without the war, there is no telling how long it would have lasted. With the outbreak of World War II, Gold became a strategic commodity. Worldwide trading of the metal by individuals and corporations was banned. At the same time, the gold stock of the US Treasury continued to grow because of bullion transfer for foreign purchases of military hardware. In September 1949, the US Treasury, at the high point of America's gold power, owned US dollar 24.6 billion worth of bullion at 35 US dollars per ounce. Phase five, 45 to 68 Bretton Woods. In July of 1944, representatives of 44 nations gathered at Bretton Woods to discuss the post-war international monetary system. It was decided that the US dollar and gold would become the sole reserve currencies. The outcome was nothing more than America dictating the US dollar's official supremacy the only currency convertible into gold by foreign central banks. So all the world currencies were expressed in terms of and closely tied to the US dollar. In turn, the dollar was still fixed to gold. Only the United States could change the price of gold and all other nations were forced to either increase the value or devalue in terms of US dollars. Under Bretton Woods, the US had a commitment to maintain the value of the dollar by buying and selling unlimited quantities of gold at 35 US dollars per ounce. It also had the commitment to pay gold to foreign central banks, but often that commitment was not met or the US would have lost all its gold. 
Diplomatic pressure was applied to prevent gold withdrawals from the US. James Steins recalls an incident when President Johnson discouraged Germany, for example, from converting its US dollar into gold by reminding it that US troops stood between it and Russia. From that moment, it was possible for the US to pay their debt in US dollars, which they created out of thin air. French President Charles de Gaulle called this the exorbitant privilege. Phase 6, 68 to 71, the demise of the system Bretton Woods. During the 60s, the US dollars lost ongoing trust and more and more governments started to exchange their US dollar into physical gold. The French government bought nearly 3 billion of gold from the US Treasury and shipped the bulk of its gold custody holdings at the New York Fed to Paris and generally challenged the functioning of the Bretton Woods system. The London gold pool, which had been established to oppress the price of gold, failed. It was then decided, as part of the Washington Agreement, to close it down and to establish a two-tiered gold price. One for the central banks at 35 US dollars and one for the free market. Central banks were forbidden to have anything to do with the free market. They could neither buy nor sell in it. The two-tier system divorced monetary from non-monetary gold for the next seven years. By March 1968, the US dollar gold stock had plummeted to around 10.5 billion priced at 35 US dollar per ounce versus 24.6 billion in 1949. Within the same months, the US Congress removed the 25% gold reserve requirement for Federal Reserve notes. The end of this monetary tragedy was reached when the Bank of England and the Swiss National Bank asked for gold in exchange for their dollars in 1971. Richard Salzman, American economist and lecturer, wrote in his book Gold and Liberty that by 1971 more than half of the gold supply that was forcibly taken from US citizens in the 1930 ended up in the vaults of foreign central banks. This was the biggest bank haste in world history. It happened in slow motion and may not have been the intent of every official who participated in it. President Nixon responded and, on August 15, 1971, closed the gold window by refusing to allow the Treasury to redeem any foreign-held dollars in gold. Closing the gold window was, according to Salzman, a polite expression for defaulting on gold payments and repudiating an international monetary agreement. Salzman also said, when gold was demonetized in 1971, many critics of gold predicted that its price would fall below $35 per ounce. They assumed that the paper dollar gave value to gold, not the other way around. The past has shown that nothing could be more wrong than this statement. Phase 7, since the 15th of August 1971, the fiat money system. Since August 1971, the dollar became nothing more than a fiat currency, and the Fed were then free to continue its monetary expansion at will. The result is, as we have seen, a massive explosion of debt. The problem with this mountain of debt is that it simply cannot be repaid. That is, as John Axter mentioned once, quote, a funny thing. It always must be repaid, if not by the debtor, then by the lender, or worse still, the taxpayers. Last but not least, here we can see a slide provided by Ferdinand Lips and Chuck Troxler from their book Money, Gold and the Truth, which reflects how stable the British consumer prices were under the gold standard since 1661. Prices were not higher in 1914 than in 1961. However, it's obvious to see that we have a problem since 1914. This chart <clears throat> shows the clearly intact downward trend of most currencies vis-a-vis -vis gold. The equally weighted currency baskets consists of US dollar, euros, British pound and Swiss franc. As you can see, 
the Swiss franc has lost so far only 90% of its purchasing power because Switzerland used to be for the longest period on a quasi gold standard until it until it was decided by the parliament in November 1996 to decouple the Swiss franc from gold. The reason for that is because Switzerland joined the International Monetary Fund in 1992 and under its laws, gold does not qualify as a monetary reserve. In September 1996, an agreement amongst 15 central banks was signed that all of them were going to sell gold in the future. There you can see how the currency market reacted to this statement, paper appreciated versus gold, especially in US dollars and Great Britain, pound for a short period of time only. In July 1998, Greenspan came out with the following statement while testifying before the Banking Committee of the US House of Representatives. The central banks stand ready to lease gold in increasing quantities should the price of gold rise. Within the 90s, central banks started to lease their gold reserves to the big bullion banks. Reginald Ho, American lawyer and gold analyst, describes its process as follows with the aim to oppress the rise in gold prices. If the gold prices pushed too high, gold is dumped on the market in London and New York. Because of the leasing from central banks to bullion banks, such as Morgan, Chase, Citibank, Deutsche Bank, as well as later on UBS and Credit Suisse, these big money houses made hefty profits from leasing gold. At the end of 1999, Deutsche Bank alone showed trades with an estimate value of 5,000 tons of gold, 1,500 tons more than the official gold reserves of Germany. Morgan, Chase and Citibank declared figures in June of 2000 that would be the equivalent of a gold mountain of 8,461 tons. How goes further by saying the trades follow a simple pattern. Banks borrow gold from central banks at extremely low interests. The advantage for the central bank is that at least a small profit is drawn from the largely useless piles of gold in stock. The banks then sell the borrowed gold bars. With the proceeds, they buy financial instruments, the yield of which are surpasses the lease rate. This business is a lucrative as it is risky and all of its own margin. If the gold price breaks out too far, Deutsche Bank, Goldman, Chase and the other cohorts pay a heavy price. Then the leasing rate would climb as well and worse, they would not be able to pay for market purchases required to return the borrowed gold for the central banks eventually want the borrowed gold back. Interesting in this context is that Gordon Brown sold 60% of the British gold reserves between 1999 and 2002. At the same time, the Swiss National Bank increased its gold lending activities from 187 tons in 1998 to 316 tons in 1999. In June 1999, a law was designed to permit gold sales. In spite of this, 1,300 tons of excess gold were included in the Washington Agreement and the Swiss started selling them. These combined actions at least helped to keep the price of gold down for a certain while again. François-Marie Arouet, or better known as Voltaire, who has been a witness of the so-called Mississippi bubble, another fiat money adventure established by John Law in France around 1720, stated once, paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value zero. We fully agree with Voltaire and have little reason to believe that the downward trend should subside in the foreseeable future, which is why we stick to our positive assessment of the future gold price development. Let's have a look at the gold price increase during the period 2002 to 2012. Here you can see the prices in US dollars, euros and Swiss franc. Huh? The gold price has risen from US dollar 278 at the beginning of 2002 to US dollar 1590 by middle of July 2012, a clear and pronounced increase of 471%. Gold in Euro from 312 Euro to 1297 Euros an increase of 316%. 
gold in Swiss franc from 460 to 1558, an increase of 238%. So, gold is the barometer that indicates that there is something wrong with the fiat currency, otherwise it wouldn't go up. This slide reflects the relative strength, or better said, weakness of each currency in which gold is quoted. That's why gold increased in US dollars the most, because it is reflecting the biggest distrust in this particular currency during the past 11 years. Interesting to see on this slide is that the price in US dollars has corrected much more since its peak in August of 2011. As you can see, the price in Euro and Swiss franc are approximately on the same level. This shows that the raising distrust in the Euro and the Swiss franc because of the ongoing Euro crisis, as well as ongoing weakening of the Swiss franc due to the intervention by the Swiss National Bank to pack the Euro to the Swiss franc at the level of Swiss franc 120, have left their marks. The US dollar is still profiting from its erroneously safe haven status, and that's why the people are fleeing out of the Euro and Swiss franc into the US dollar. Since August 2011 up to July 2012, the Swiss franc lost 21% versus the US dollars and the euro lost 16% versus the US dollar. But as you can see, gold kept its value in euro and Swiss franc and was not going through a correction such as the US dollar. Before we are going to judge any further if the price is too high or too low, let's dive in some hard facts when it comes to supply and demand side of gold. So here we can see the gold overall supply in percentage, the so-called stock to flow ratio, most important reason for monetary relevance. So here we can see jewelry total reserves in stocks, 84,000, which reflects 50% of the total stock, private holdings, 31,000 tons and 19%, uh, central banks reserve 20,000 tons and represents 12% of the total stock and others 33.6, which equals 19%. So total reserves on stock in tons is 168,000, and we have approximately 2,600 tons additionally money, uh, gold supply coming uh, on a yearly basis, which reflects 1.5% of the total stock. So in contrast to other commodities, the discrepancy between annual production and total available supply for gold and silver is enormous. This is called a high stock to flow ratio. The aggregated volume of all the gold ever produced comes to about 170,000 tons. This is the stock. Annual production was close to 2,600 tons in 2011, that is the flow. Dividing the former by the latter, we receive the stock to flow ratio of 65 years. Silver has also high existing stock versus yearly flows of 20 years. Crude, copper, corn or wheat have a stock of a few months only. Even there we can see that gold and silver is different than a normal commodity. Ronald Stöffele, precious metals analyst of SC Group Research, described it as follows. Gold reserves grow by about 1.5% every year and thus at a much slower rate than any of the money supply aggregates around the world. The growth rate is vaguely in line with population growth. Trust in the current and future purchasing power of money or any means of payment not only depends on how much is available now, but also on how the quantity is expected to change over time. What does, what does that mean in numbers? If the annual mine production were to double, which is highly uh, unlikely, this would translate into an annual increase of only 3% in the supply of gold. This is still a very minor inflation of total gold reserves, especially compared to current rates of dilution of paper currency. We therefore agree with the conclusion of Ronald Stöffele that gold is not precious because it is scarce, but because the opposite is true. Gold is precious because the annual production is so low relative to the stock. Gold has acquired this feature over centuries and cannot lose it anymore. This stability and safety is a crucial prerequisite for the creation of trust. And it is what clearly differentiates gold and silver as monetary metals from commodities and the other precious metals. Commodities are consumed, whereas gold is hoarded. 
The demand side is made up of investors, mainly the jewelry industry, uh, industrial industry, private individual, and as we will see in the next slide, also by central banks. But this still is still only a fraction of total demand. Reservation demand accounts for the largest part of demand. This term describes gold owners who do not want to sell gold at the current price level. By refusing to sell, they are responsible for the price remaining at the same level. This means that the decision not to sell at current prices is as important as the decision to buy gold. In net terms, the effect on the price is the same. The gold supply is therefore always high. At the price of US dollars 5,000, the supply of recycled gold would exceed annual production several times. This also explains why the often quoted gold deficit is a fairy tale. Do you know how much gold is being traded on average per day? According to London Bullion Market Association, 10.9 billion ounces of gold worth a total of 15,200 15, billion US dollars were traded in the first quarter of 2011. This equals 125 times the annual production or twice the amount of gold that has ever been produced. This leads to a daily turnover of 240 billion per day means a higher turnover than for most of the currency pairs. By comparison, the daily turnover of Apple shares is US dollars 5.5 billion. This means that gold is one of the most liquid asset classes in the world. What also has, to, what also has changed since 1970 is that up to then almost 70% of the production came from South African mines. The production nowadays is broadly diversified from a geographic perspective. Gold is now produced on all continents, with the exception of Antarctica. Therefore, gold is much better anchored on a global scale. All these facts lead to an actual renaissance of gold in traditional finance. Due to its high liquidity and unique characteristics, gold is becoming ever more prominent as collateral. Along with LCH, ClearNet, Intercontinental Exchange, JP Morgan and the CME Group and Eurex too now accepts gold as collateral. Actually, talks are held to have gold acknowledged as tier one asset within the framework of Basel III. So what about the supply side when it comes to the official sector sales? What we can see here is that the central banks became net buyers. Even the central bank seems to remember that gold is money. Gold is pushed back into the monetary system again. Do you see a trend here? The world central banks became net buyers of gold for the first time in 2010, after they were previously net sellers for many decades. During 2010, the world central banks bought 87 metric tons of gold more than they sold. The gold supply by official sector sales fell from 545 tons in 2002 to a negative 440 tons in 2011. For many years now, central banks in the West have been the sellers, whereas especially countries in the Middle East as well as emerging markets such as Mexico, Russia, Turkey, South Korea, but especially China and India have become the buyers. We at Global Gold expect that this trend will continue with further acquisition by emerging market central banks and no significant sale by those in advanced economies. Here we can see the demand side and the clear shift visible. So the dark one is technology. Here we see jewelry and the pinky one is the reflecting the investment side. So this is a combined overview of the three gold demand forces, technology, jewelry, and investment. So what this tell us? To summarize the facts we provide here, the gold supply demand situation has mainly been influenced by gold investment demand, including official sector demand. With all other variables, they are relatively stable compared to that of the gold investment demand. In any attempt to predict the development of the future gold price, it is important to understand this gold investment compound. Here we can see from roughly 9% going up to almost 40%. The past decade was characterized more strongly by deflation fear than inflation fear. 
One might assume that investors didn't buy gold as an inflation hedge, what gold is actually famous known for. People brought precious metal as a hedge against all sorts of crises. Political, financial, economic, currency, geopolitical, etc. If one assumes that these crisis scenarios are still in place and that none of these crises have been solved, or if one even assumes that these crisis scenarios have even grown closer, bigger or more numerous, and the reason for having a crisis hedge are becoming more convincing every day, then one might expect that gold investment demand, demand will increase and will drive prices higher. In a world long on potential crises and short on any sustainable solutions, we are convinced that it is the right thing to do to stick to gold and, for that matter, have to continue to buy more gold for quite some time to come. This is the gold investment demands uh, 2002 to 2011, isolated in this picture. So an increase of 366%. So gold investment demand has changed the most over the past 11 years, both in absolute and relative terms. It changed from 352 tons in 2002 to 1,641 tons in 2011, an increase of 1,289 tons, and it changed from 10% of the total demand in 2002 to 40% of the total demand in 2011, an increase of 30% percentage points. So, is gold in a bubble? So this slide shows you the yellow line is reflecting the bull market 1970 to 1980 and in blue you can see the actual bull market since uh, 1999. So history teaches us that every bull market ends in euphoria and excess. This slide is comparing index based the bull market between 1970 and 80 versus the actual bull market since 1999. The yellow line shows the bull market starting in 1970 when gold stood at 41 US dollars and went up to 850 US dollars by 1980, which represents a 20 times multiplicator. Very interesting to see is that within the last six weeks before the crash, the gold price doubled. Here we can see this within the last six weeks, gold price doubled. How does it start it based on the view of the famous Swiss private banker and editor of Gold Wars, Ferdinand Lips? What happened before Nixon closed the gold window? As US short-term dollar liabilities to foreigners were continuing to rise, French economist Jacques Rueff recommended doubling the gold price in order to restore confidence in the dollar. When he suggested this in 1962 to President Kennedy during his visit to Paris, Kennedy answered that he could not do this to the American people. Therefore, the goal announced in 1964 that France is going to exchange their US dollars for gold and ask to physically transport the metals back to France. Until summer 1966, France managed to increase their reserves up to 86% with physical gold. By August 1971, the situation had reached a critical stage. Neither the two-tier system nor the appeasement by politicians and economists of all sorts helped. In August, U.S. short-term dollar liabilities to foreigners were estimated at about 60 billion, of which about two-thirds were owed to foreign official institutions. At U.S. dollar 35 per ounce, U.S. gold holdings had shrunk to U.S. dollar 9.7 billion. On August 9, 1971, the price of gold reached a new high of 43.94 U.S. dollars. Germany's mark had gained 7% since being floated on May 10, 1971. This meant that the US dollars effectively had been devaluated by 10%. Swiss banks also temporarily suspended trading dollars in attempt to stem the growing monetary panic. The end of this monetary tragedy was reached when the Bank of England and the SMB asked for gold in exchange for their dollars. President Nixon responded and closed the gold window by refusing to allow Treasury to redeem and foreign held dollars in gold. 
Important to know is that in 1980, due to the revolution by Ayatollah Khomeini, followed by the occupation of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, the U.S. government freezed the Iranian gold reserves in the U.S. and therefore the Iranians panicked and started buying physical gold like crazy in Switzerland. Please note that already by 1968, the Swiss banks had captured an estimate 80% of the world physical gold market. Not only could they offer the most modern banking facilities, but each of the big banks also had their own precious metal refinery. From then on, Zurich was the biggest gold trading center in the world. London only began to regain some of its prominence with the launching of the gold future markets. Let's get back again to the situation in 1980. In addition to the Iranian crisis, riots took place in Saudi Arabia and at the Mosque of Mecca. Within the same period, the famous Hunt brothers were purchasing all physical silver, which was available, unfortunately, financed with bank credits, which breaked their neck later on. So all the events basically led to euphoria and excess in 1980. The blue line, however, is reflecting the actual bull market since 1999 up to the end of 2011, which represents a multiplicator of 4.5 times. It's a complete different picture. Notwithstanding the above, I would like to underline that gold was pushed out of the monetary system by the end of 1980. As we have seen before, gold is being pushed into the system again because of the ongoing purchases by certain central banks and because of the fact that the investment demand for gold in general has increased tremendously. Therefore, we are convinced that gold will play a key role in the future monetary system again and prices will therefore increase further because the value of all the fiat paper money will depreciate due to ongoing exponential expansion in true money supply. Interesting is also the fact that in 1980, 23% of the world total assets were parked in gold at the price of $850 an ounce and 14% in silver based on its highest price of 50 US dollars per ounce. At the end of September last year, gold reflected only 3.6% of the world financial assets at the price of 1421 US dollar and silver stood for 0.7%. These are facts that show that the upside potential of physical gold and silver is still tremendous. So to conclude, we don't see a bubble in gold and the only similarity to the situation in 1980 versus today is that we are again confronted with a possible extremely dangerous conflict in the Middle East and Iran in particular. The Iranian banks were kicked out of the SWIFT system a few months ago and are now trading oil and gas with India in gold. The last time another country tried to bypass the US dollars was Iraq under Saddam Hussein. I'm convinced that this led to the US invasion, which has been justified to the Western world based on evidence which turned out to be all lies and rumors without any substance at all. Therefore, it is obvious that you can finance wars as long as you have the ability, power, to print money into existence based on nothing than thin air. Percentage of dollar backed by gold. This is a very interesting slide. So the graph on top of the slide is illustrating that in the US at the moment, with the current gold price of 1610, only 16% of the monetary base is covered by gold. In spite of the 11 years of bull market, this is only slightly higher than at the time of the absolute low in terms of gold cover of 11% in 2001. Do you see the high after the end of Bretton Woods in 1980, when 168% of the monetary base was backed by US gold reserves? The red line is showing the average coverage during the past 40 years has stood at 34%. The shadow gold price reflects a price level if all the paper dollars would be packed by gold. So even here, we can't see a gold price bubble. To cover the monetary base, gold should go up to $10,062. And here you see the comparison, 1971, 18% coverage ratio when the gold price stood at 41. So quite an impressive 
slide. What about the ratio US debt and value of gold reserves? Today, only 2.4% of US government debt is covered by the US gold reserves, if any. As per Ronald Stoeffele from ESG Group Research, this is substantially below the long-term average of 4.9%. Here's the red line. If the gold price were to double or the government debt were to drop by 50%, which is rather less likely, the coverage ratio would only match the long-term mean. Only at the price of about $16,000 would the ratio reach the highest of 1980. In other words, long-term bull markets never end around averages, but always set extreme values vis-a-vis -vis other asset classes at the end of the trend. This supports our argument that gold is still attractively valued and that the gold price has not entered into its final trend acceleration phase yet. What about Dow Jones and the gold ratio since 1900? So this is another slide from the famous gold report of Ronald Stoeffele, ESG Group Austria. The Dow gold currently stands at 7.8. The ratio is currently above the long-term medium of 5.8. This means that gold is still relatively inexpensive in comparison with the Dow Jones index. However, it is not dirty cheap anymore, but as mentioned before, bull markets tend to end in euphoria and excess, which is why a substantial lower ratio is expected. In 1932, the ratio was 2, and at the end of the last bull market, the ratio was 1.3. Therefore, Ronald Stoeffele, as well as we at Global Gold, expecting that the values of 2 might be reached again and as a result of the secular bull market. Under this assumption of a constant Dow Jones index, Gold would therefore have to rise to US dollars 6,200 per ounce. So what about the S&P 500? Ronald Stoeffele has also compared gold versus the S&P 500, whereby the current ratio stands above its long-term median of 0.88. The chart shows the formation of a bottom much like a couple handle formation from 1994 to about 2008. As per Ronnie, he expects a dynamic increase towards higher levels when comparing the current situation with the development in the 1970s, bull markets and in extremis. In order to reach six, as in 1980, gold would have to increase to 7,800 per ounce, given a constant S&P index. So let's speak what would happen in a deflationary scenario. So here if I'm showing you the X to pyramide with the answer of what's happening in a deflationary scenario, that deflation leads to an improvement in monetary quality. In a deflationary depression, liquidity flow from the higher part of the pyramid downwards amid falling willingness to assume risk. Philip Barton describes credit in his book Safe Haven, A History of Gold, as slumbering mistrust. Creditors try to sell the continuously falling number of liquid assets and heave for the lower assets classes as a result of their ris rising risk aversion. At the bottom end is gold. Since gold does not hang on any form of IOU, it is the only alternative to paper money and is thus at the bottom of the upside down pyramid. As we can see in monetary history, during a period of profound deflation, the investment focus shifts from capital growth to capital preserv preservation. Deflation thus always comes with falling confidence in the perceived root cause of the crisis, such as government, banks, speculators, and their rating. Therefore, the purchasing power of gold gains also within a deflationary scenario. Let me quote John Exter, famous American economist, vice president of the Federal Reserve New York, member of the Mont Pelerin Society of the Council of Foreign Relations, which is quite an interesting combination, and of the Committee for Monetary Research and Education, as well as founder of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka.
He has been the creator of the extras pyramid, also known as extra golden pyramid or extras inverted pyramid. Quote, so the bottom line for the world economy does not look good. You can do much to protect yourself. Go down the pyramid, get liquid. Federal Reserve currency notes are at the very bottom of the paper part. Hold enough to get through this current liquidity squeeze when banks might close and cash will be king. Treasury bills are good too. They earn interest, but you cannot spend them in the supermarket. Here we might add that he made this statement in the 50s, so I personally would skip uh, the treasury bills because this is the biggest bubble I can see. So he goes on saying, but the best asset of all, whether in inflation or deflation, will be gold at the base of the pyramid. Accumulate what you can of it, either above the ground, like coins or bullion, or in the ground, like mining shares. In summary, an increase in prosperity and growing confidence would then boost willingness to assume risk again, causing a gradual inflow of liquidity from the gold sector into the higher segments of the pyramid. And a new cycle starts. Deflation therefore means an improvement in monetary quality, whereas inflation means an increase in monetary quantity. So let me close with the findings of the Zimbabwe School of Economics. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in any manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. So this is a famous quote of John Maynard Keynes. Uh, so before we go on with physical precious metals. So let's come to the part how to invest in precious metals. So different ways how to invest in precious metals. What are your options? So let's start with the mining shares. I mean, we love mining shares. The only challenge is to come up with the right selection. Doc Casey said once 95% is crap and only 5% are real. However, it is an investment involving more speculation and comes from a growth perspective. The backyard approach can be a solution for a small amount of metals with the aim to have them immediately available when needed. However, make sure you are digging on a regular basis so that your neighbors don't think twice about your new hobby and don't forget the location of your cash. A safe deposit box. Advantage, very cheap. Disadvantage, always related to a bank account. In times like these, we can see how fast the banking rules are changing in terms of privacy. In addition, the metals are not insured against theft, fire, and if the bank goes bust or a bank holiday is declared, it might be very difficult to regain access for a longer period of time. In the event of a government confiscation, they could be frozen too. Online programs. Most of them are focused on the retail market and you can buy coin by coin. Therefore, they might involve higher premiums for certain bars and coins. In addition, some of them don't come along with a dedicated storage op opinion, uh, option. Watch out for the jurisdictions they are operating under, for example, US law. This might be a disadvantage if the US decides to freeze assets, gold of US accounts. Try to find out how the account is set up. If it's through a bank, then it could take a tremendous amount of time to unwind the assets, especially if you believe that the next crisis will involve the financial banking system again. Other allocated programs, well, the best solution I've seen so far is gold money because this one is 100% physically allocated based on 12.5 kilo standard bars. This solution is very attractive if you intend to regularly trade in and out of gold and silver, mainly to profit from the volatility in the market, then this might be the right solution. However, you can ask for physical delivery, but then you have to pay an additional premium and only certain formats such as uh, when it comes to gold, one kilo, 100 gram gold money bars are available. So 
the fabrication delays can be sustainable depending on market conditions. The famous paper solution with claim status. So um, if you believe that the actual crisis will pass and everyone will be happy again, it might be a solution for you. But if you buy gold to protect you from a severe crisis, then we consider these solutions as not very attractive because they are nothing more than a promise to gold. Huh? Doesn't matter, bank metal account, precious metal certificates, mutual fund, structured product. Uh, already the amount of paper gold in the market should ring an alert, alert bell. The paper market is a hundred times bigger than all the physical gold produced dicked out so far in history. So in a real crisis scenario, you can't be sure to receive any metals at all. Always important when it comes to ETFs and so on is that you read the terms and conditions because you will be surprised what you will find in it. Let me give you an example about the GLD. So let's cl take a closer look uh, about the famous uh, ETF, the GLD. So why don't you want to invest in, in this one? First of all, dependence on the New York Stock Exchange. So if the stocks are closed, the GLD will stop as well. The funds does not allow in-kind redemption of its gold bullion. The GLD's refusal to facilitate an in-kind redemption, in other words, the delivery of physical gold upon request of the investor, this does at least raise some questions. GLD does not appear to have storage is issues. So the Tacobe ETF had around 70 tons of gold stored and it was hard to find more secure and cost efficient storage space. So this has been all over the press over here in Switzerland. GLD basically has no storage issues. They should store at the moment more than 100,000 standard bars, which reflects at the moment 1,300 tons of gold. So no such news is to be found anywhere on GLD that does raise suspicions. The gold holdings are not audited. As reflected in their terms and conditions, even monitoring is limited. In fact, the subcustodians don't have to provide any documentation for proof of the existence of the underlying gold. The obvious question then becomes how an investor is supposed to know there is actually any gold in the vaults at all. The gold holdings of GLD are not insured. So the gold holdings of GLD, if there were any, are not insured. Loss, damage, theft, fraud are obviously risk factors that any allocated gold program will face. Solid gold programs deal with it by ensuring the value of the gold in storage. In the case of GLD, all risk is passed on to the investor. The quality of gold is not confirmed. That's a hilarious one. Neither the trustee nor the custodian confirms the fineness of the gold. Our conclusion to this statement, you're not only unsure of any gold being there at all, but now you are not sure of its purity, if there were anything physical held in storage. You still wouldn't know whether it is investment grade gold or just a heap of tungsten. The second remark is even more hilarious. The gold is not protected from the custodian's insolvency. Therefore, your investment is not protected or insured in any way. If they go bankrupt, your investment will be lost as well. The GLD doesn't exclude the possibility of leasing. The SEC allows short selling of these funds, which is a fraud itself. There are millions of shares short in GLD and this, and this does not even count the naked short since they are not required to declare. Why do you want to invest money in gold when you can be sure that your investment will be used to push the price of gold down? The whims of US government. GLD is a Wall Street product which translates into high exposure to Washington. The institution on Wall Street are backed by government. Programs run by them provide for zero protection from confiscation, taxation or regulatory nonsense. Most important to keep in mind is their huge conflict of interest. There are very firms that have been involved in the process of short selling gold and silver in huge quantities. That they would be involved in creating ETFs that are physically backed by real precious metals has to be considered as most unlikely unless they have 
a hidden agenda and highly questionable purposes. In general, it seems that we have been going through a gradual shift from paper gold investment towards physical purchases. This year, physical investment demand will most likely exceed ETFs demand by a factor of five, as per Reynold Stoffele. Only a few years ago, the situation was exactly the opposite. With ETFs accounting for 80% of investment demand, this paradigm shift shows the gradual loss of confidence in paper gold. So it all comes down to the true sentence, if you can't hold it, you don't own it. So how global gold can help protect your future and why are we different? So who is Global Gold? We were founded and registered as a Swiss corporation in 2008. We launched our precious metal program in July 2009. And this is our commercial registration number. We are regulated by Swiss Financial Market Authority, so-called the FINMA, via VQF, membership registration number 12808. We are 75% subsidiary of BFI Capital Group, a Swiss wealth management group in business since 1991. And you can find more information on Global Gold at www.globalgold.ch. For further information on BFI Capital Group, www.bficapital.com and the Mountain Vision newsletter where, we, where BFI is um, promoting its uh, big picture on a regular basis. A very interesting uh, letter I can uh, suggest. You can uh, sign up at uh, www.mountainvision.com. So what the Global Gold programs, uh, program offers. A safe, convenient and efficient way to buy, store, sell and or deliver allocated bullion gold, silver, platinum and palladium bars and coins in Switzerland. And most important, outside the banking system. So 10 reasons why Global Gold is 100% different. The really, the aim of us is to cover the important details which will make the difference in the case of crisis scenario. First of all, we are a 100% non-banking solution. So if the banks uh, will be freezed or stock uh, exchange will be closed, um, we don't care because it won't affect us. We don't buy, sell from two banks and uh, so we are 100% non-banking solution. The customer owns its metals under 100% direct and unencumbered ownership. So this is a key point you always have to take into consideration should you invest in physical metals. Our program is free of small print cash settlement clauses. So once again, a cash settlement clause is basically a clause which offers certain institution instead of paying in, in a crisis uh, scenario, instead of paying physical metals to the customer, that they can pay him out in cash. And this is definitely what you don't, uh, what you are not looking for if you are investing in, in precious metals. So we don't, we don't have a, a cash settlement clause. We are 100% uh, offering high security storage locations. For the time being, we are offering it in Zurich and Hong Kong. And within the next few weeks, we will also offer high security storage in Singapore. So 100% the metals are insured and audited. 100% physically stored investment grade bullion coins and bars. And I think most important when it comes to that, we buy from the beginning the metals in the format of your choice. So if you want to buy Kruger or Maple, we go out into the market and buy on behalf of you the Krugers and the, and the, the Maple Leafs. So in the format of your choice, so that whenever you basically would ask for a delivery, that we can do it without any delay. So 
all the metals are 100% deliverable at any time. So no additional uh, minting down. Uh, so all the metals are there and they are fully yours. So you can trade, um, sell and buy 100% tax free, even when it comes to silver. Um, so only if the metals are leaving our setup at the tax free zone, uh, then you would have, for example, on silver, you would have to pay 8% VAT if you pick it up here in Switzerland, or it's uh, up to the to the VAT regime of the respective country we would have to ship in uh, based on your instructions. But otherwise, you can buy, sell uh, gold and silver uh, tax-free. So we are offering 100% competitive pricing. So we buy at the uh, institutional level and we are 100% Swiss. And I think even uh, when it comes to property rights and to Switzerland as jurisdictions, in terms of property rights, we believe that operating under Swiss law is still a huge uh, uh, selling point. And because of our decentralized political system based on federalistic structures, we also consider still the place to store precious metals, the safest place to store precious metals for the time being, still in Switzerland. In addition, we have also a process in place which allows our customers to deliver their physical uh, and already purchased metals into our program. For further details, you can get in touch with us. So we are convinced of the absolute necessity to safely keep part of one's asset in physically allocated precious metals, particularly gold and silver. A growing number of savvy investors recognize that the world's financial system and fiat currency model exhibit flaws that require prudent precautionary measures. They want to acquire and safely store allocated precious metals in a secure location from where they can be delivered anytime and everywhere, anywhere, or from where they can be sold promptly and conveniently when the time is right. Global Gold was founded to offer its client a solid solution that addresses precisely these objectives. It was founded for the purpose of offering a solution that works and meets their client's expectation even and particularly during a severe financial crisis. So with us, as I mentioned before, you can purchase a wide array of recognized formats. We offer the most liquid and famous coins and also bars. Uh, it's all investment grade um, and you can buy with us gold, silver, platinum and palladium. Global gold fees. We are offering a tailor-made pricing for private and institutional customers in terms of uh, brokerage and storage fees. And our attractive and highly competitive pricing is based on a sliding scale. So for further information or a tailor-made offer, please contact Global Gold. So this is the end. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was able to provide you with some insights uh, which have been uh, useful to you uh, for your decisions or for your big picture when it comes about the next few uh, months and years. Wishing you a very good day. Uh, all the very best, Claudio Grasso.